Listen, I need you to take your seats for just a moment. Worship team, you're going to be right back up. Y'all come down this way. Y'all going to be right back up, just like that. Marquise, if you could just stay on the keys. We are in, you can take, I'm not even going to use that tonight. I just need to release something in the spirit of the people of this house. How many of you realize these are intense times? Some of you didn't respond because you're so numb. <laughs> You've just been fighting, fighting. But when we started out this year, we spent the entire first month in camouflage. I want to let you know that we are prepared for this battle and for this fight. We're prepared to contend with the winds of darkness that are swirling around our head. The key is understanding that we don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. We are already victorious in Christ Jesus. In fact, Yahweh, the covenant-keeping God, sees every battle that you're fighting right now. I just have a few things to release, and literally it's going to take just a couple of minutes. We're going to close out and worship tonight. How many of you have said to yourself over the past few weeks, how long? Is this thing on tonight? I'm just... I mean, can y'all hear me? How long? I, I know because I've been seeing the text threads of the people that are sick and dealing with illness. And there were some folks we were hoping they'd be done, you know, get you a little two-day, three-day bug and bounce back. And now here it is. It's been a week and a half, two weeks. Some of y'all were in that. I know of folks, they, they caught the covid then got out of that, then caught the flu. And the question is, how long? I'm not used to being down this long. How many of you are going through some things that you thought would be resolved by now? I'm standing by faith and believing in the Lord, just hoping that whatever it is would be done. And here we are, April the 9th, and you're still dealing with and contending with what has not, in your eyes, been resolved yet. How many have been believing God for some things to move in your life, even financially in terms of resource? You guys know what we're dealing with as a congregation, some things that we're believing God for. And it seemed like the moment we begin to proclaim that we believe God for some things, it's like the enemy just unleashed an attack in the very area what which we're believing God for. And you ask yourself the question, how long? How long before the promises of God come forth, the things that he has spoken very clearly? I'm not talking about the fake stuff that we just make up. I'm not talking about the motivational speeches that we give ourselves. I'm talking about the times that we heard clearly from God. And he speaks to us and he gives us a vision for our family. He gives us a vision for our career. He gives us a vision for ministry, for the house of God. And you hold on to that and you believe it. You put your whole trust and hope in it, yet it seems like that which God declared is taking longer than possible. It's okay to admit that you've asked the Lord how long. And I know we're super spiritual, saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Spirit. I, I know you've been to the third heaven and back during your lunch break. I know. I know you hear from God, speak to God. You've got three different prayer languages. Five different dialects, I know. But it's okay to have faith and believe in God and to still have the question echoing in your heart, how long? How long will I be in between? How long will I have to wait? How long will I have to suffer? Well, believe it or not, that's a biblical question. We can look to books like the book of Psalms and we can see the writer's wrestling with that question. Psalm 13, the psalmist says, How long, O Lord, you forget me forever? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? See, the songs that we sing, they're designed to help remind us of what, what God has promised. You'll never leave me. You'll never forsake me. But there are times where we feel forgotten. Just because you feel something doesn't mean that it's true. Part of the process of embracing truth is acknowledging what you feel and then leaning into the truth that you know that's greater than what you feel. It's okay to acknowledge that sometimes you feel forgotten. 
Like, did God forget about me? You ever called customer service and they put you in a queue and they said it's only going to be two minutes? 75 minutes later, you're wondering, did they forget about me? God is not like customer service in the earth. He doesn't forget about us. However, because he's sovereign and he controls time, what seems like forever for us is only a blink of his eye. So the psalmist is saying, how long? And, and he's asking, Lord, have you forgotten about me? Are you hiding your face from me? Did, did I do something to offend you to the point that you are not responding to my plea? The psalmist asks again, how long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all day? See, when it feels like God isn't speaking, you start talking to yourself. How many of you know that sometimes you got to close the conversation with yourself? That, that, that if you're not careful, you will... <laughs> Talk yourself into a worse situation. There are times where we feel like, God, you haven't responded. So then we start to counsel within our soul and we can't find an answer. And then we start looking at our enemies. We start looking at the people that aren't even serving God and it seems like they're prospering. And we begin to ask questions like this. How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O oh Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. There are times where you get to a place to say, Lord, if, if you don't speak, if you don't move, I'm done. If you don't show up in this situation, I don't know what else to do. If you don't make this thing happen, if you don't send protection, if you don't step in and intervene, I might as well be as good as dead. And I'm speaking even to some of you. For some of us, that's metaphorical, but some of us wrestle with suicidal thoughts. And I want to let you know that God sees you. God hears you. God knows what you're going through. He feels your pain. And don't think that just because you have not gotten the response that you want, that God is not responding. Because as we mature in the faith, we begin to understand that a yes from God is righteous. A no from God is righteous. And even sometimes seemingly in the silence, God is still righteous. <laughs> we start to think, and my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. The things that I'm trying to overcome, we start getting pictures of those things having victory over us. The things that we deem to be the worst case scenarios start popping up in our head and all we can think about is what defeat looks like and what defeat sounds like. But look at verse number five. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. You see the shift? See, here's the thing about being honest about your feelings. You can have feelings. You have feelings. But at some point as a believer, you've got to shift from your feelings and re-anchor yourself in truth. It's like the scripture that says, be angry, but sin not. Anger is a natural, human feeling and emotion, but you have to be careful that you don't stay in anger so long that it becomes sin. So even in the, in the writings of the Psalms, you see this wrestling, and, and you see this difficulty, and you see this expression, and you see this transparency, and you see this, oh, it's okay to be transparent. It's okay to say, Lord, how long? The writer said, how long? Three times in the same passage. How long? How long? How long? He started to get a vision of what his enemies could potentially do, but then he moves from focusing on the situation and the problem to focusing on the God of covenant. Worry magnifies your problems. Worship magnifies the Lord, the only one who can help you with your problems. You can only focus on one thing at a time. And at some point, you got to shift and pivot and stop focusing on the problem and start focusing on the power of God. So the writer begins to declare who God is. I have trusted in your loving kindness. Somebody say, God is good. He has what we call loving kindness. 
It's a kindness that, that, that's motivated from his love. He, he does kind things towards us because he loves us. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. And we as believers in Christ, we know that we've been saved and rescued from the penalty of sin. But we also know that the, the hand of God is still mighty to save us from situations and deliver us from predicaments. When you read the Old Testament, you see the hand of God stepping in time and time again. He did it for David with the stone and the sling. He did it for Daniel in the lion's den. He did it for the three Hebrew boys in the fire. He did it for Samson even after he messed up. One last time the Lord showed up and all of it was to reveal the glory of Yahweh. Here to let you know that God still is bringing salvation. For those who are lost and you don't have a relationship with the Lord, we're singing about Yahweh. You're saying, who is that? Is that some dude down the block? Let me tell you who he is. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the eternally existing God. We believe there is one creator with a capital C. He created the heavens and the earth, and he created you and I. The breath that's in our lungs is because Yahweh put it there. And he sent his only begotten son, Jesus, Yeshua, Hamashiach, Jesus, the Messiah, to die on the cross for our sins. Jesus performed a miracle. He gave his life as a sacrifice so that our sins could be forgiven. And he rose on the third day with all power in his hands. And according to the scripture, he's sitting on the right hand of the Father. And he's coming back again. But who is he coming back for? He's coming back for people who trust in a covenant relationship with the Father in heaven through the Son, Jesus Christ. And they are sealed with the Spirit of God. And if you have the Spirit of God, you can sing in the midst of calamity. If you have the Spirit of God, you begin to understand that your joy is not dependent on what happens. Your joy is dependent on what you know. Pain in your body, you still have a song. Sickness all around you, you still have a song. All types of issues popping off, new problems. You learn how to count it all joy when you fall into various trials and tribulations because it's producing something within you. So the psalmist ends like this, and this is how we're going to end tonight. I will sing to the Lord. The psalmist doesn't get to the end and say, well, maybe I'll sing when I feel better. Maybe I'll sing when my enemies are proven wrong. Maybe I'll sing when I finally get a favorable answer. No, he's like, before I finish this writing, before I finish this expression, I'm going to put a full stop with worship and praise. I will sing to the Lord. Why? Because he has dealt bountifully with me. So in other words, the writer is reflecting on all the things that God has already done, even in the midst of what he's believing God for. And he's come to the conclusion that although I have pain, although I have enemies, although I have things that I need a response for, I still stand ten toes down on the fact that you have been good to me. All my life you have been faithful. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am taking, I will sing of the goodness of God. And that goodness is running after me. It might seem like yeah, you could say that I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. It might seem like things are getting worse. But here, I'm, I'm, I'm reminding you that our Father is constant in an ever-changing world. He's still good, even as things get bad. He's still good, even as the world has lost its mind. He's still good. The earth is shaking, but the Lord is still speaking. So here's what I want to deal with tonight, and then we're going to worship and close out. Problem is our tension between the chronos and the kairos. Time and scripture is broken up into two concepts. These are Greek words, chronos and kairos. Chronos deals with dates, minutes, seconds, hours, days. How long? Right? We ask how long, and it's a matter of the calendar. I thought I was going to be down for two or three days. Then you learned you got flu B, not flu A. And now what was going to be a couple of days, now it's turned into two weeks. And you're saying, Lord, how long? You're looking at the clock. The Lord told you that something was going to happen in your life. There was going to be a shift. 
that, that you were going to pursue something and, and you believed him and now you, it's April and, and it feels like things are getting slower rather than going faster. The tension between the Kronos and the Kairos is that Kronos deals with what we see as earthly time. Kairos is the divine timing of God. Kairos means the appointed time of God, the season of God. There is what we call a suddenly season, due season. When God says something's going to happen, it's going to happen. And God can, as I would say, the kairos conspires through the kairos, that sometimes our delay is strategic. Sometimes the delay is exactly what we needed. Sometimes the delay was just part of God's plan. And it's actually not a negative thing. It's just part of God's purpose. So the kairos is not against the kairos. That's how we tend to see it. The Kronos and the Kairos are working together for our good because all things work together for the good of those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to resubmit our Kronos to the Kairos timing of God. If God said it, we believe it. And although we feel, Lord, how long, how long, how long, we're going to be reminded that God has got this. And he's still great and he's still mighty. And he still can do anything because <laughs> that's who he is. He's got loving kindness. See that hourglass up there? My, my kids had this toy. And just last night, we were finishing up with dinner. And um, this toy had an, an hourglass. It was a little glass hourglass. And the kids were cleaning up. And somehow the hourglass fell and the glass broke. And it shattered, and we had to clean it up. And I didn't really think anything about it last night, but as I was preparing for tonight, something prophetic fell in my spirit, and it all made sense. Here it is. The hourglass is broken. Watch the heavens, not the calendar. The hourglass is broken. Watch the heavens. Not the calendar. The hourglass is broken. Watch the heavens. Not your calendar. The hourglass is broken. And when we stop watching the hourglass, and we start watching the heavens, we'll be so consumed with drawing near unto him because he draws near to us. When we start focusing on the heavens, what they say back in the day, a watch pot doesn't boil. Watch pot doesn't boil. Sometimes you got to walk away and come back at the appointed time. And there are some things, once we become so enamored with him, we'll lose a sense of time. And then that's where the suddenly comes. The suddenly comes. The suddenly comes. All of a sudden, it'll be worth it. All of a sudden, all of the labor pains, all of the drama, all of the trauma that you endured is nothing compared to the glory that you'll experience. Come on, is there anybody here that's waiting for that appointed time? Anybody here that won't grow weary and well-doing? Because in due season, you know you will reap a harvest. If you faint not, is there anyone that's going to put a punctuation mark? You've had your conversation about how long. You've had your conversation about how long. Is there anybody in Pivot that'll stand up on their feet? Come on, Pivot. Y'all stand up. Watch the heavens, not the calendar. Watch the heavens, not the clock. How long? How long? How long? When God says... How long when God says it? How long when God says it? How long? How long? When it's time, it's time. How long? I don't know when, I don't know the day nor the hour. But one thing I can do is draw near unto him and he'll draw near unto me. Watch the heavens and not the calendar. Come on, can you lift your hands? This song is called Mighty Ones. Mighty one, we worship you. We worship you. For I've tasted and seen your goodness. Remember, his loving kindness stands. Remember, he's got this. 
remember he's good remember he knows exactly what you're going through watch the heavens watch the heavens watch the heavens watch the heavens not the calendar come on begin to open up your mouth as the worship team sings this let there be the connection between the song and your unrestrained worship begin to open up your mouth to lift up your hearts hallelujah come on there's something powerful about expressing your love your trust your faith your confidence there's something about expressing it there's something about expressing it come on you might have had your how long situation all week all month all year you've been saying how long but God has answered and responded. He's giving you a word that's going to keep you through the next quarter. The hourglass is broken. Watch the heavens, not the calendar. And watch God exceed your expectations. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.